Egyptian mythology is probably the least represented of the three popular Western mythos. Series like God of War, the Riordan books, and superhero fandoms cover a large part of Greek and Norse theologies. Even if you don't know what their gods represent, you still know of most of them by name. While Egypt has been covered in similar magnitude, I feel we always see just the tip of the iceberg as being one of the most ancient religions. It is a very complicated and multifaceted history with only a select few gods in the spotlight. Riordan's Cain Chronicles and Marvel's Moon Knight have shed some light on the basic heroes and villains of Egyptian mythology, but there are several gods and goddesses most people have never even heard of. In this video, I will explore 10 Egyptian gods you may not be familiar with. I'll stick to more major gods to keep things simple, as there are far too many overlapping minor gods to count, a point I'll touch on further down the list. Number 10. Sobek. Sobek was the crocodile-headed god of the Nile commonly associated with crocodiles, water, and fertility. As a god of water and the Nile, Sobek played a crucial role in the annual flooding of the river, which was essential for the fertility of the land and the success of agriculture. He was also seen as a protective deity, guarding against the dangers of the Nile and even crocodiles themselves. Crocodiles have strong stomachs and can eat both fresh and rotten flesh. Because of this, ancient Egyptians also believed he could ward off evil and safeguard both the living and the dead. In this way, he was often linked with Horus. Egyptian gods have many tales, legends, cults, and alternative versions of themselves. In some myths, Sobek is the son of the sky goddess Nut and earth god Geb, being linked closely to the sun god Ra, and thus referred to as Sobek Ra. In one story, after Osiris was cut into pieces by Set, one particular part of his body floated down the Nile, and a hungry Sobek couldn't resist the urge to eat it. As punishment for his lack of self-control, his tongue was cut out, resulting in crocodiles having no tongues in Egyptian myths. Nice one, bud. Number 9. Kepri God of scarab beetles, the rising sun, creation and transformation, Kepri roughly translates to he who comes into being, or he who transforms. The ancient Egyptians observed the behavior of the dung beetle, a type of scarab, rolling balls of dung along the ground. They noticed that the beetle laid its eggs in these dung balls, buried them, and then emerged later, seemingly born from the dung ball. This behavior led to the association of the scarab beetle with the sun's daily renewal and resurrection. The proximity to the sun naturally links Kepri to Ra and the sun, particularly its rising in the eastern horizon. In ancient Egyptian cosmology, the sun travels through the underworld at night, a necessary process of transformation and regeneration echoing the beetle's emergence from the dung ball. Kepri's aspect of rebirth and resurrection also linked him to funeral rites, and scarabs were commonly used as amulets and placed on the mummies of deceased individuals to provide protection and aid in their journey to the afterlife. Number 8. Knum. Knum was a sort of counterpart to Sobek, associated with the source and flow of the Nile as well as with creation and fertility. His ram head was symbolic of his connection to the animal, with rams also being symbols of fertility and virility, with their curved horns representing the flow of the Nile. Knum also played a crucial role in Egyptian creation myths. He was one of the primeval gods who molded the bodies of humans and gods on his potter's wheel using clay from the banks of the Nile. He was considered a skilled craftsman and the divine potter who shaped life. He also had a very nice beard. Number 7. Hecate. Often depicted as Kanum's wife, the frog-headed Hecate was the goddess of childbirth, renewal, and, you guessed it, fertility. Pregnant women invoked her for a safe and successful delivery. She was thought to be present during the birthing process, aiding women in labor and ensuring the newborn's health. In creation myths, she breathed life into the first humans, further emphasizing her role in the birth process. Her frog head was symbolic of fertility and water, associated with the annual flooding of the Nile, which brought fertility to the land. The connection between Hecate and the frog may also be related to the loud croaking sounds of frogs during the breeding season, reminiscent of the sounds of labor. 
She was also considered a protective deity for young children, and amulets and charms featuring her image were believed to provide protection for infants. Number 6. Taweret. I hope I pronounced that right. Almost a sort of precursor goddess to Hecate, Taweret was another childbirth goddess, but more associated with pregnancy overall. Taweret means the Great One, or the Powerful One, and this is reflected in her mighty presence, having the head of a hippo, the limbs of a lion, and the tail of a crocodile. Each of these animals was associated with a different part of the natural world, and further cemented her multifaceted role as both protector and caregiver. Like Hecate, she was also a protector of young children, but her icons were also believed to safeguard pregnant women as well. Her presence at the home protected households and families from various dangers. If you're noticing some overlap, you are correct. Ancient Egyptian gods were often mixed or combined with other gods from different eras and kingdoms, and as time went on, certain deities fell out of favor, while others took the spotlight in their particular domain. Hey, since you're still watching, don't forget to like the video if you're learning something, and subscribe for more content like this. Number 5. Tefnut. Goddess of moisture, rain, dew, and often associated with order and balance. Tefnut is one of the earliest deities in the Egyptian pantheon and is often mentioned in creation myths. Her lioness head represents her fierce and protective qualities and is also associated with the powerful yet unpredictable nature of the elements. In Heliopolitan creation myths, she is the offspring of the primordial gods Atum and Neith, and with her twin brother Shu, who personified air and dryness, raised the sky and traveled through the heavens, separating air from moisture. In addition to her elemental ties, Tefna is also sometimes linked to Mat, representing cosmic order and balance. She did not have dedicated temples, but was venerated as part of the larger cosmic order in connection to other deities. <laughs> Moist. Number 4. Maftet a goddess of justice, judgment, and protection against venomous animals, often shown with the head of a wildcat, often a cheetah, Maftet is a protective deity and was invoked when guarding against dangerous creatures and enacting justice. The wildcat, or cheetah, symbolizes swiftness, agility, and ferocity. She is often seen with other feline deities, like the goddess Bastet, with overlapping protective qualities. Maftet was revered for her protective quality against venomous creatures such as snakes and scorpions. Her role as a defender against these dangerous animals made her popular among those seeking protection in everyday life. Her feline form with its swift and decisive actions came to symbolize the swift and just dispensation of judgment. Maftet was mainly worshipped in the pre-dynastic period, and thus her importance may have evolved throughout different periods of Egyptian history. Number 3. Bess. Bess is known for his protective yet playful nature. He is depicted as a dwarf with a feathered headdress and is usually shown standing or dancing on his tiptoes. Bess was primarily a protector of the home, family, and sometimes childbirth as pregnant women would place his image in birthing chambers in hope of a smooth birthing experience. His association with music and dance was believed to bring joy and laughter. Bess was also a tutelary deity of dwarves, and was sometimes invoked for protection of those with dwarfism. Bess's popularity endured for centuries, and his imagery continued to be used even beyond ancient Egypt. I wonder if Gimli could pull off those moves. Number 2. Wajit. Another protective goddess, but this time of royalty and the divine feminine. She was usually depicted as a winged cobra, whose association with deadly venom emphasized her defensive capability against harmful forces. She was mostly worshipped in Lower Egypt, the northern part, and her cobra image, known as the Uraeus, was a prominent symbol on the crowns of pharaohs, representing Wajit's protection over royalty. The Eye of Wajit, also known as the Eye of Horus, was a powerful symbol of healing 
and royal power that was especially common in tombs of rulers to safeguard their journey in the afterlife. In some tales, it was she who planted the first papyrus in the Nile Delta and helped Isis hide and raise Horus in safety from Set. And finally, we come to number one. Just to be clear, I didn't create this list based on who was the strangest or least known. I kind of just picked these gods in no particular order. But even I myself, as a perhaps slightly above average Egyptian mythology fan, was surprised to hear about this one, Renenutet. Took me a while to get that name down, but Renenutet was another cobra-headed goddess linked to agriculture and bountiful aspects of harvest, as well as motherhood. Her name means the snake who nourishes, and she was primarily associated with the ripening of crops, particularly grain, and her blessings were essential for any agricultural endeavor. Her cobra head was seen as both protective and destructive, representing the duality of fertility and scarcity. Renenutet is normally viewed as a motherly figure, caring for both the land and its inhabitants, and in some traditions was a direct offspring of Ra himself, Batum's wife, or even the mother of Osiris. She would often appear as a fire-breathing cobra protecting the pharaoh from his enemies. Next time your farmer relative has a successful year, tell them to thank Snake Mom. I hope you learned something new from this video. Whether it was a god you truly never heard of, or one you knew of but now know something about. I'd like to cover more obscure mythologies in the future, such as Celtic or Slavic, or even Shinto deities. So leave a comment if you'd be interested. Like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more feudal facts. I'll see you all next time.